Hello, everyone. I hope that this uh, video finds you well. Today, we're going to be talking about a section that is not relevant to everybody, but is relevant to most. And even for those who at this moment, this section is not particularly relevant. It may be one day, which is the method section. And uh, the method section is something that is part of this course only to a limited extent because uh, obviously the method is something that you devise together with your fellow researchers. If you're a doctoral student or your master's student, then you're developing this with your advisor, your orientador. So I can't really change the method, but I can try to help you talk about it um, in a way that uh, will avoid some typical problems. Uh, I also hope that uh, you guys had a good lunch today and you're and you're feeling OK, because I think a part of today's uh, subject matter might uh, gross you out a little bit. <laughs> I'm also going to try putting these captions on here in this case, see if they work. They seem to be working. My words are appearing at the bottom of the screen. I don't know if they're appearing in your screen, but they are on my screen. OK. So today, um, what and uh, who you should remember when you are trying to write your method section. We're also going to look at how the method section attaches to the other parts of the IMRAD. So as I just mentioned, I'm going, I'm going to show you something today that some of you might feel is kind of gross, kind of disgusting, but uh, it is it, it has a purpose. It is important to today's discussion about the method section. So you're going to see a video in a second. You don't have to worry about the audio so much. It's mostly the video part in which um, there is a sniff test. You've heard about taste tests, right? When you might have a double blind uh, Coca-Cola versus Pepsi and people trying to say which one is better or whatever. Well, this is a sniff test. And uh, as you'll see, there is a particular method that they use in this. Now, I want you just to, to think for a moment about um, how would uh, you go about devising a sniff test experiment? And what's, what sort of variables could come into that? What kind of variables uh, could come into a sniff test experiment? So I'm going to play this for you and then just keep that in mind. Keep those questions about what variables um, could influence the results of a sniff test involving deodorants, okay? So here is uh, the video. I'll play this now. Again, don't worry about the audio.
All right. So um, as I as I mentioned, there there's no need for audio. The audio in this is not important. Instead, what is important is about the procedure involved in this kind of experiment. I'm going to play it again, and this time I want you to write down um, a couple of questions, any questions that you might have about the method. Because as you can see, there's a sniff test to decide which is the best deodorant, and there is a winner. How did they come to this winner? How did they come to this result? And as you can see, there is one female judge. I don't know if you, you'll notice that she's holding something in her hand. And maybe you can guess what that is, this kind of a cup of something. She's writing something down. And then there are these participants who are these men playing basketball. Uh, and all of this is part of this experiment. And at the end, a decision is made about which is the most pleasing smell, right? Now, as you can as you can imagine, there be a, there may be a number of variables that could influence the results of such an experiment. <clears throat> so, as you watch, uh, think about what questions need to be answered in order to confirm the validity of the results. I'll play it one more time. Okay, so the winner was degree for men. That was judged as the best deodorant. But how valid are those results? So what, what, what kind of questions should you be asking? So that's what I want you to do now. I want you to go to the chat, go to your, your chat in, in your computer and send questions that you think a good researcher would ask in order to confirm the validity of that result, in order to understand if that result is meaningful. What do you need to understand about the method in order to understand that result? So I just want you to send questions like, for example, um, why did they choose that woman? Uh, how did they how did they choose those brands? All kinds of questions. So I'd like you to send those questions in the chat. And then my collaborators here, Vivian, uh, Deborah, Juliana will uh, send the will repeat the questions to me. And we'll, we'll talk about it for a few minutes. There's a question here. Qual a quantidade de desodorante foi utilizada? Very good. So the question is, how much of the deodorant was used? That makes sense because was there was that variable controlled about you know how much spray was it sort of just a or was it a 
Um, because obviously any change in the quantity of the application of the deodorant could influence the degree of the potency of the smell. There's another one. When was the last shower of the guys? Right. So in order to understand uh, the results, you need to know if everybody took a shower uh, the same time, because obviously if one of those guys has not showered in 10 days, then he's going to be a lot smellier than the guy who showered 10 minutes ago. Another question. Did the girl repeat the result? The winner, did the winner repeat the result? Did the winner repeat the result? All right, so I guess the question is, can you replicate that finding? I don't know. And another person said, it is okay for only one person to smell. Should there not be multiple judges? Right, so very good. In this experiment, there was only one judge. So a question can be asked about the reliability of that judgment. What is research sample size? So how, yes, very good. How representative is this sample of the general population? Why these four or five men? Or why this sampling of these particular deodorants? Como os homens foram selecionados? So, how were the the odor donors? How were the men in this experiment selected? How were they recruited? So that that matters in order to determine if there is any particular bias. Why did she have a cup of coffee beans in her hands? Yes. So she did have a cup of coffee beans. And I imagine that that is designed to neutralize uh, the smell so that there isn't any after or lingering effects of one man's armpit to the next man's armpit, comma, I assume. I don't know if that's been validated, but I think that's probably what that was for. What are the criteria for evaluating the products? Very good. So what criteria did the female judge use to evaluate the smell, and I would even think that those criteria should somehow be validated. So another question is, did she use criteria that had been validated in other studies, other similar studies before? Who financed the experiment and why? Yeah, so was there any potential bias due to funding from one of the manufacturers of the deodorant that won, for example. Ela julgou o antes e o depois do desodorante? Yes, very good. Uh, so was there a time one and time two design? Was there some kind of baseline comparison point. So smelling the armpit before and then any change afterwards. Yeah, that's interesting. 
how do biological factors affect the deodorant efficiency? Right, so these are all different men, and maybe there are biological uh, factors that could influence the, the effectiveness or the effect of the deodorant. And there are, I'm sure there are all kinds of different potentially confounding variables there, including those related to metabolism and who knows what else. Todos os desodorantes eram de rolon ou spray? That's a very good question. So, was there a uniformity in the form of delivery of the deodorant? Um, does what the participant, participants have eaten earlier influence on their perspiration? Excellent. Yes. So, was diet controlled for before the experiment? Obviously, if one guy had beer and another guy had something with a lot of garlic in it, maybe that would influence the outcome of the smell. So, was diet controlled for before the experiment? Is the woman related to any of the men? Did she know any of them previously? Exactly. So, did this woman have any kind of relationship to any of the participants? Is she the girlfriend or the sister of one of them? Obviously, that could bias the results. Why? What is she evaluating? Preference, efficacy, recognize of brand? Yes. So what is the operationalization of the criteria? Is it a measure of hedonicity? Is it a measure of uh, whatever? There needs to be some kind of understanding of what exactly is being assessed. And why? And there's a question related to this. Um, ela era uma cheiradora com treinamento para o teste? <laughs> Did she have a carteira assinada that said, <laughs> I am a cheiradora? Yeah, so was the judge trained? Was there some kind of calibration prior to the experiment. That's a very good point. The personal smell of the guys couldn't affect the preference of the girl. Yeah. So what, what about the natural smell of the guy? Could not that also bias the result? Does having hair on the armpit influence the result? Yeah. That's a very good question. So, what about controlling for the amount of hair? Did other similar studies in the past perhaps ask their participants to shave their armpits in order for that variable not to influence the results? And if not, then why did they choose that? Uh, what literature is there that addresses this issue of armpit hair because it would seem that that may influence the results. Um, what about placebo deodorant? Yeah, so was it was there a control in the design? I don't think there I don't think there was. These are all excellent. Uh, these are all excellent, excellent questions. And um, you guys are, I'm sure you guys think of, or can think of many, many other questions for this. The point of this is that imagine you are a reviewer for Armpit Smelling Journal. You will have these questions as you're reading. Now, 
if all of those questions cannot be answered or not considered by the person who designed the experiment, that's not necessarily a, a reason to reject. But it is a question that a, a critical reader and somebody who's familiar with that science will ask. And so a good writer, if it isn't part of the design of their method, they'll anticipate these questions before they write them and, um, and they will justify their choices in the method. And then any possible limitations that may be caused by um, the choices made in the method will need to be talked about in the discussion section. So clearly there is a relationship between the method, the results, and the discussion, because whatever results you have, the only meaning that they hold is based on the method that rendered those results. Your results are an artifact of the method that you design. So if, for example, uh, there's the, the, the experiment um, didn't have any coffee, um, any coffee grounds, then it could be questioned. One question that could be raised is, OK, so wasn't there any possibility that the smell of one armpit could have influenced the other? But there was a choice that was made in this research, this rather funny research design here where there was a coffee, a cup of coffee grounds. OK. Obviously, this is just a silly, simple example, but you get the point, I think. Now, imagine all of those questions that you asked. You had a lot of questions, and there are many questions that we didn't even take here. And imagine the following method section. I'm going to show you a method section that is based on that research that we just saw, that method, that, that, does that experiment. Read the method section. And you tell me if it is good and why or why not. So this is just imaginary. It's not a real method section. Just imagine. I'll read it together with you. So men, n equals four, I think it was five, I don't know, were chosen for the experiment. After playing basketball, each man applied two different deodorants, one on each armpit. A young woman was recruited to judge how pleasing the smell of each deodorant was. The female judge smelled each armpit, each time noting her impressions. Her final analysis was then given based on the notes taken. So do you think that this is an adequate method section? Well, the answer is clearly no. Because all of those questions that you asked, and you are not from the smelling sciences, most of you, all of those questions that you asked about how they chose the the men, how they chose the woman, the amount of deodorant that was applied, the choice between spray and roll on, uh, the duration of the smell, the uh, armpit hair issue, all of that and many, many more would could possibly influence the results. And here, you see a very kind of overly simplistic, missing out so much information here. And why does this happen? This is actually, it's an exaggeration, but it happens when, uh, in, my, in my view, when someone who is working on their PhD, working on their master's degree, spends so much time thinking about their method that they they forget about very important details that should be put in. If there is a time to be excessive about the details of of how you arrived at your results, it's here. Here you can you can lean you can err on the side of excess when it comes to detail. Um, a, a lot of excess, a lot of detail here can maybe even irritate the reviewer somewhat. But at least it doesn't make them think how on earth did they come to this result. And so here, for example, even though the woman was carrying a cup of coffee grounds, it's not mentioned here. And maybe that's because in this imaginary world that I'm 
I'm portraying here. Maybe the person who wrote this method section just forgot about it because it was it's so obvious. They've done it so much. They've thought about it so much. They forgot to put it in. So you would probably ask a lot of the questions that you already asked about this method, and you don't want to do that. And when you send to your review, your method section for review your, your, in your article, you don't want the reviewer to be frustrated and not understand where the where the where the results came from and have a disconnect there. So speaking of disconnect and connect, as you've seen and we've talked about many times already in this course, in your IMRED section, you shouldn't think of these things as separate, but always interconnected. The introduction connecting to the method, method connecting to the results, and the results connecting to the discussion. And all of these things actually connected to each other. Why does the method section matter? Why is it important? What makes a good method section and how does it connect to the introduction exactly? And we're going to go over that uh, now. One thing to keep in mind why the method section is important is because this is one sensitive area for the naysayer. All of those questions that you just answered, or rather those questions that you just sent, through the chat are questions that the naysayer would ask. And if they, if they can't find those answers there, he's going to ask in, uh, in a review of your article. And, and the, the number of questions asked, the more questions are asked, the more questions that that naysayer asks, the less likely your article will lead to, will eventually be um, accepted, um, or, or another way to put it, the more questions that the naysayer asks during at their method section, the more questions the naysayer is forced to ask, the more likely your paper will will be will can lead to a rejection. Of course, it's not only the method section, although that can be a section that causes a rejection. It's often a kind of um, a kind of uh, mix of a lot of things. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this class, not every article has a method section or not every chapter um, has a method section. But the reason why any of this matters to you, even if you believe that the method section is not doesn't apply to you in particular, one thing that is true is that the ability to defend your method is relevant to everyone. You need to be able to justify your research irrespective of the the discipline that you're in you need to be able to be able to explain why you're talking about something or why you're doing this the way you're doing it why you chose a particular approach so good writers they think about this guy as they're writing throughout the writing process of course and when they get to the method section they're thinking okay what questions might the naysayer ask here and the answer to those questions should go back to the method section. And the method section will connect to your in issues that you bring up in your introduction. For example, uh, armpit hair. Well, if this guy controlled for armpit hair, then he needs to mention that in the, in the method section. But not only there, probably in the introduction section, it needs to be brought up. Now, what 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 research is there out there in the introduction section? What does research say about how different um, different features of the body can influence smell? That's got to come up in the introduction, then brought up in the method section, and then possibly in the in the discussion section. You remember that I did a kind of survey, um, a very brief. Um, overview of a number of researchers that talk about why articles get rejected from the Journal of Second Language Writing to Academic Medicine, Respiratory Care, Journal of Professional Nursing, Journal of Hospitality and Tourism Research. And these are people who have looked at why articles get rejected in particular journals. And so you have a, a wide variety of areas here. And when I talked about this in an earlier week, that was week two, I think. It was in the context of 
does language cause rejection? And we established that it doesn't. Language alone uh, may cause a desk rejection, but when it goes to review, it doesn't cause rejection alone among reviewers. It's a plethora of, of other things. One of the things that commonly is mentioned is rejection, is the method section. So, for example, in the Diane Belcher research, we saw, uh, if you look at that again, 66% of the negative reviews commented on methods and research design. In the Sullivan paper, it was the number eight issue um, in, in why uh, papers get rejected. In the Pearson uh, research in the journal Respiratory Care, um, it was the number four issue, so um, quite wide, quite high up there. And in the McCurcher et al. research, it was the number one. The number one issue was issues in the methodology. So you can write beautiful you can write a beautiful manuscript in terms of the prose you may be an excellent writer with you know use amazing vocabulary no mistakes perfect punctuation perfect formatting of the and then if your method section is no good then it doesn't matter and so if you so here you can see that a faulty method is one of the most common problems. Here is a manuscript that I rejected not too long ago. And let's look at what what the rejection says. It says, I found the article to be well written and with a mostly clear purpose. Unfortunately, there is a disconnect between what the research questions portend and what the paper ultimately delivers. One of the problems is to do with methodology. First, there is very little transparency. We know that the authors sampled from 98 English medium journals indexed by Cielo, yet we do not learn much about Cielo, nor why it was chosen for this study. Further, the authors report that seven subject areas were ultimately included in the corpus, but we do not know anything about why these subject areas were chosen. The sample size of each nor why, nor even the size of the corpus as a whole. The method section then abruptly skips to the results and discussion section with many questions left unanswered. And so it's this problem here. Many questions left unanswered it ultimately doomed, and it wasn't me, obviously there was another reviewer and came to the same conclusion. And here you have it, with the first sentence saying, well, I found the article to be well written, so it was it was there was no there was no mistakes in English or anything like that. But the method made no sense. There, there were these research questions that sounded very interesting, and then the method could not match what those research questions were promising to do. And it was and I and the re the researchers, rather the reviewers, could not understand where uh, those results were coming from and why why they had chosen these particular um, these particular uh, samples for and so it ultimately it left uh, a, it, it resulted in, in a, unfortunately in a rejection. Writing maybe you may write very well, but if you have little transparency that means including important details that the naysayer may ask and if you leave the the reviewer with many questions left unanswered obviously that's not a good thing when this questionnaire that you've seen before that journals often send to reviewers to to complete when they when they submit the review one of the things is this right here our methodological and or theoretical matters uh, comprehensively described. So that's a question you need to, if you have a method section, and even if you don't, um, consider if the methodological or theoretical matters in your in your article, if they're being comprehensively described, are you including everything in your method discussion, your, in your presentation of the method, that helps the reviewer understand 
how you arrive at your interpretations. And the interpretations, of course, come later in the discussion section. We're going to talk about that next week. So next, I want to talk about how does the method section connect exactly to other sections of a research article? And the answer, the quick answer is it connects to all of them. But let's look at how that works in practice. All right, so we've, we've looked at the interconnectedness of, of IMRAD, but this introduction method results and discussion can be looked at a different way as well. Where the method connects back to the introduction. So if you start with your results, that will uh, that's come from your method and whatever you put in your method might need to go into your introduction. So in this uh, video, this very short, funny experiment here, um, it, there are some concepts, related concepts that appear in another more serious article, but maybe not that serious, that appears in a real journal called Chemical Senses. And this is an article with the title, The Effect of Meat Consumption on Body Odor Attractiveness. If you are a vegan watching this broadcast right now, then you will be very happy that you are a vegan after we talk about this article. Uh, I myself, I'm not, but after reading this article, I, I've, I've considered it. So um, in this journal, Chemical Senses, and obviously the title is very clear. We've talked about this, this kind of title, the effect of something, something on something, something. And so I assume that there hadn't been a lot of research before looking at does meat, the consumption of meat, affect how nice somebody or not nice somebody smells. So if you keep in mind all of the variables that you uh, had in mind with the other sniff tests, let's look at how these two researchers here, Havlicek and uh, Le Le Lenoshova, um, how, they, uh, how they present their method. <laughs> and if you will be grossed out by this by the end of it. Okay. So um, this we're going to look at this online here, not on on uh, Moodle, or not on um, Moodle. We're looking at this right here. So um, and when they get to the part about smelling, they say not only is body odor pre-programmed by genetic factors, but also much variability is due to psychophysiological and ecological influences, for instance. It has been shown repeatedly that body odor changes across uh, body odor changes across women's menstrual cycle, peaking in attractiveness around the time of ovulation. So here they're talking about how the menstrual cycle um, it it can influence uh, attractiveness uh, around the time of ovulation. Now Think about your own research. If you're doing your, your thesis or your dissertation, in those kinds of works, in, in, a, in a thesis, in a dissertation, you're including everything and everything in the kitchen sink in there because you want to show the, your, your defense committee, the banca of the defesa in, in, your, in your cases, that you have read that you have read widely, and that you have become somewhat of an expert in your particular area, and so you have you need to show wide reading, right? Contrast that with the research article. In the research article, you need to get to your point faster, and so if they mention something about women's menstrual cycle, one would expect that this has a, there's a reason for it. It somehow influences the method, which then can somehow influence the results, which then will need to be talked about in the discussion section. So if a character, I talk about these, these concepts as characters, if a character like the three little pigs is introduced in the introduction, then it needs to have a role. And in fact, in this case, it does. It's not random, the, that they're introducing the menstrual cycle here. It's not that they're trying to demonstrate that they're, of all the possible influences, that's something you might do in your thesis. 
That's something you might do in your dissertation, but not in a research article. OK. So keep in mind, keep your mind on that there. Also, they mentioned mood again. Why would they do that? What's mood? Well, if, if I'm a reviewer and I'm reading this, I'm thinking, OK, mood will have something to do with the method, which will have something to do with the results, which have something to do with the discussion. As was mentioned in the deodorant experiment, um, eating habits, diet would obviously have something to do. And so they talk about this. They say eating habits also may have a crucial impact on body odor consumption. However, very little is known. So here you have a kind of justification for the research. Here you have a kind of niche, a kind of move to. However, very little is known about the effect of individual alimentary components on human body odor. Some folk, some folk beliefs connect odor hedonicity with meat consumption. For instance, Hindu Indians who are usually vegetarians say that people who eat meat smell bad because of it, as Comarec personal communication. To our knowledge, however, this effect has not yet been tested under controlled conditions. So, here you have this very key, two key phases, very, very well signaled here. This however, which is one signal, very little is known is another good signal. And then to our knowledge is another good signal. However, this fact has not yet been tested. So they're clearly justifying the research. And they're mentioning that there is some anecdotal evidence that that if you don't eat meat, you smell better. And they even they don't have apparently they don't have other literature to cite because this is something new that hadn't been looked at before. So they cite a personal communication from S. Kamarek. I assume that S. Kamarek is Kamarek is somebody who is a big name in that particular field of smelling science. Uh, and I think it's actually quite funny uh, because I wonder what that personal communication was exactly. I don't know if it was an exchange between the researchers and Kamarek, sort of like, hey, you are a Hindu Indian vegetarian. What do you think about us meat eaters? I don't know. I think it's quite funny. I would love to see that personal communication. All right, so now we're going to look at the, the method section. What elements do you see there that were raised in the introduction section? So here you have it. Method section. None of the women were using hormonal contraception and all reported having a normal menstrual cycle length, 25 to 40 days. They were all they were also asked about the date of the onset of their last menstrual bleeding, day one. Women in nine in days nine to fifteen of their cycle on the testing day were judged to be in fertile phase and others to be in non-fertile phases of the cycle. So here you have, first of all, a clear rationale. Uh, of who they chose and why. They have um, inclusion criteria, which have been established by the, the, the justification in the, the literature review in the introduction. Um, and you see, and it's clear why they brought up menstrual cycle in the introduction. It's brought up again here in uh, the method section. And so you understand why they, why they chose these people, you have inclusion and exclusion criteria, and you understand why they did that. Here, something else that was brought up in the introduction, the odor donors, I love this word odor donor. <laughs> the odor donors followed our diet protocol for two weeks. And here you understand why diet was mentioned. Uh, prior to the odor sampling, they were also asked to keep a diet diary in which they recorded all food eaten during the day and alcoholic beverages and level of stress, fatigue and general mood using a seven point scale. Now, if if one suddenly put the word mood in here in this method section and did not bring it up in the introduction section, it wouldn't it wouldn't work as well. But since it was brought up in the introduction section, then you understand when you get to the method section, OK, why mood was part of this, because it could influence um, it appears to influence smell and therefore um, influence the results. So you can see how the method section um, at least is linked to the introduction section. And the introduction section portends 
or foreshadows what will happen in the method section, which then in turn affects everything else, of course. So details, details, details. Details create the big picture in the sense that if you if you provide all the details in the method section, then the reader, the reviewer is able to then understand better how you get to where you get to, how you arrive at your interpretations. If they don't understand that, if it's not clear in the, in the method section, then it just can cause frustration and confusion. So here you have uh, an, a, an, a subsection in the, part about the, in the method section of the participants. Often in a method section, you have a section about the participants. And look at this. They say 17 male students of Charles University Prague agreed to participate in the study. Their mean age was 22.5 years, minimum 19, maximum 31 years, body weight 75.5 kilos, minimum 63, maximum 88 kilos. The body height was 182 centimeters, minimum 171, maximum 200. All of them were non-smokers, reported no dermatological or other diseases and did not shave their armpits. The donors were given this amount of money, approximately 45 pounds as compensation for their time and potential inconvenience caused by the prescribed diet. And so these are not random issues, right? All of these things are put in there and they're talking to whom? They're talking to the naysayer. They're talking to the person who's going to wonder about these things. So did metabolic um, features perhaps influence uh, the smell? Well, you have here things like how much they weighed. Here you see that if, this, if they were this height and they were this weight, then they weren't obese. Uh, you also know that they didn't smoke, which could influence smell. You also know that they didn't have any other diseases. And they also are very transparent and they admit that they didn't shave their armpits. And so this you have a, po a possible confounding variables, a, conf a possible confounding variable in the armpit hair because maybe hair can influence. And you have obviously age. So you compare that to, to this here. Look at the difference. You, you don't know about why the men were chosen, their ages, their height, their weight, anything like that. You don't know about their diet. We don't know how long they played basketball. We don't know um, anything about uh, why the, the deodorants were chosen. Um, we don't know how the woman was recruited, it, what criteria she used, if there was any change in the intensity with which she smelled the, each armpit, all of that. Not even an inclusion of things that are good for this experiment, in this case, where she carried this cup of coffee grounds. Um, mentioning that would, would be a good thing and what it was for. So here you have a very poor method section. It's not a real method section, but I've seen method sections that look almost this bad. You have an example of inadequate description of the methods. And, and these are one of the top 10 reasons that a journal uh, will reject an article. So you got to hear that naysayer. You know, and you can read this in the method section. You can hear the answer. You can hear you can hear the the authors of this paper talking to the naysayer, and they're, and they're they're hearing him ask these questions. They're hearing him say, "But how do you know the participants followed the instructions? But how? But what about odor contamination from outside smells? But how fresh were the smells? What about the effect of the effects of repeated testing?" I think somebody actually asked this. And, and these are questions that need to be asked by you, of course, with your orientador, with your advisor, when you design your method, because then after the paper is written, you often can't go back and fix any of this. The best that you can do is justify why, you know, make, the best, make the best lemonade you can out of the lemons. But um, you can hear that the researchers are hearing these questions. These questions came up probably when they were 
designing the research. And so they need to make sure that these are included in their in the representation of the research in the method section. So they're hearing these questions. They're anticipating how they should write them in the method section. And OK, aha, uh -huh, he's the naysayer is going to ask, how do you know participants followed instructions? And so they write, aha, uh -huh. to check the odor donors conformity with the instructions, we carefully examine the diet diaries. And notice the construction here. This is where the method section interlap and overlaps with writing recommendations. A lot of people only write this part, but here you have something about the reason. So not just what they did, but why they did it. To check for the order donors conformity with the instructions, we carefully examine the diet diary. So this question, this answers that question. But what about odor contamination from outside smells? Here you have it again. To avoid odor contamination from odor donors clothes or background odor, the donors were asked to wear new 100% white cotton, white 100% cotton t-shirts previously washed without any washing powder, which could influence the smell as the first layer of clothes. Something interesting to observe here is that we don't know the extent to which this final version of the article may have been influenced by reviewers' comments. But let's look at what could have been added and what couldn't have. So for example, this here, the fact that the odor donors were asked to wear a new 100% white cotton t-shirts is something that had to have been there when the research was designed. They can't go back and fix that. So I assume that that was there. Uh, but I can imagine that maybe um, the reviewers may have asked, OK, but were the t-shirts washed before and if so was there any um did it was could that have influenced the smell was there any fragrance added to the washing powder and so they might have put this in so there's very there's not very much wiggle room once you've submitted the paper to fix the method section but you can add some details based on the comments but it's best to try to anticipate as i believe they did these authors these questions before they came up before they come up how fresh were the smells Again, you see, to avoid possible effects of refrigeration on the stimuli, our olfactory rating of the sample started within an hour after collection. But what about the effects of repeated testing? And here they have a, a statistical explanation. To test the possible effect of repeated testing, we performed repeated measures, ANOVAs for each of the dependent variables, pleasantness, for example, using odor donors as the unit of analysis. And so they, they, they did test that. They were able to control for that. So um, when you are writing, if you have a method section and when you're writing it, remember to not just say what you did, but and you should definitely say what you did, but don't also say why you did it. So many people will write, we carefully examine diet diaries. That's fine. Better is to check the odor donor's conformity with the instructions we carefully examine the diet diaries. Instead of the donors were asked to wear um, a new white 100% cotton t-shirts, right? To avoid odor contamination from odor donors clothes or background color, the donors were asked to wear new white 100% cotton t-shirts. So not just what you did, but why you did it that way. Another way to look at this IMRAD diagram, which I'm sure you're sick of right now, is that the introduction is basically why is the research necessary to begin with? The method section is how you how you how you investigate the thing you propose in the introduction. The results reflect what you what you got from your method. And then the discussion is the so what? OK, what do those results mean? But I also think that this first question of why should permeate the entire the entire article really so it's not just why the research is necessary and then how but how and why so how did you do it and why did you do it that way when you get to the results it's what and why did those results happen that way so that is tied to the method 
and the so what and why is so what does that mean and why do you think that and and that answer of why 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 should be answered by you and should be answerable by the reader at all points as much as possible and so remember to not just write the how but the how and why finally just uh to remind you that today is the day that you will begin to receive um uh, articles from people in uh your your class your classmates and that the purpose of this is um to uh you know get feedback but also you being the giver of the feedback is a is is meant to be a good exercise for you to become a critical reader if you become a critical reader then you can become developed into becoming a critical writer and good academic writers are critical writers and that helps you anticipate things like questions that they say or will ask so um, I recommend you get to the reviewing of other people's introductions as soon they're all very short um, read them fairly soon and give back and give feedback as soon as you can um, and uh, in that process as you give feedback uh, think about from your perspective how can you um, what kind of recommendations would you make to somebody to, to make it just that? Don't be afraid to be critical. Um, don't don't criticize and don't be too negative, but but do be a, a critical reader. It's just thinking, remembering that this is a a first draft, and so it's a chance for that person uh, to improve. And you'll have one week to do that, and since you do have two of them to read, I have I don't have too much. Um, for you to do on the module of this week's module on Moodle because I don't want to overload you with um, with work that you since you're going to have these other two reviews that you have to do. But there are a couple of things on the Moodle that I want you to look at, which is just simply to talk about what the process was like writing introduction and then a separate discussion on after you give the feedback, what it was like for you to provide that feedback and if you thought it was useful and so on. One more thing next week. Um, we have a guest speaker um, because we're good. Next, we're going to the results section. We're going to talk about discussing your results. And even though the results section is not something I can really do much with myself, because uh, obviously everybody will have different results, and it'll be funny for me to talk about how to write a results section. The results section basically is presenting what your results are. One thing that is uh, useful is knowing how to present your results um, in table form and in graph form. And I have a guest speaker coming in next week who's very, very good about thinking about how to present your results in table form and in graph form. And she does, she she's thought about this a lot. And um, I'll be here next week as well to introduce her, but she's going to run with the class. Um, and I hope that you find her talk very useful. So we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you next week.